Well, I'd like to welcome all of you this afternoon for what is certainly to be a fantastically interesting program. Uh, I'm Laura Bender, the Director of Development, and uh, I'm really delighted you could join us. And uh, Carla sends her regards. She was just a bit under the weather. Um, I invite you, in addition to this program, to explore the accompanying exhibit, which is over in the Science Engineering Library. It's called A Promise to the State, Celebrating the University of Arizona's Land Grant Mission. Uh, this was curated by Special Collections Archivist Erica Castaño. Erica is right back here. So um, <clears throat> you are encouraged to go and take a look at that. Before we begin, uh, I would really like to express my gratitude and appreciation to the Friends of the University Libraries for their sponsorship of this and many other events held at the libraries. Without your support, the Friends, we wouldn't have the opportunity to bring together the libraries, the university, and the greater Tucson community. I'd like to turn you over now to Richard Duffield. Uh, he told me some really spectacular things to say about him, but I'll let him do that. <laughs> <laughs> He's current chair of our board uh, of the Friends of the Libraries. So please join me in welcoming Dick Duffield. Thank you, Laura. I actually expected something a little more laudatory, but you know. <laughs> And I'll just take it from here myself. Uh, nowadays, transparency is a whole word, word, uh, word, you know what I mean. And I want to be transparent to let you know that tonight's speaker is my brother-in-law. So when I say nice things about him, just keep in mind transparency, that's it. Anyway, um, Chris is a fourth generation Arizona, grew up... Uh, Born and raised here in Tucson, Arizona, just a couple blocks away from here on 1st Street, is it, sweetheart? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then on uh, Main Avenue, so he never got very far away from the university. Graduated from Tucson High School, went on from Tucson High School to Yale University, where he received his uh, bachelor's degree. Then he taught at Pomona College over in California for several years, during which time he uh, received his Ph.D. from Yale University, and then in 1965 he uh, came to Arizona, or came back to the University of Arizona, and have, then was a uh, um, member of the faculty here for the next 40 plus years or so. So he's been around a long time. He doesn't look it, but he has been around a long time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Chris is a medievalist, or so he tells me. I have no idea what a medievalist is. But it doesn't matter because Chris can teach anything. He's taught history, modern poetry, Chaucer. Uh, I mean, he is a Renaissance man in that respect, you could say. It's in that joke, you know, about the geographer looking for the job and they ask him, how does he teach it? Uh, is it teach the earth is flat or is it round? He says, I can teach it either flat or round. And that's what Chris says. He can teach this <laughs> so it's either flat or round. Anyway, um, and I must say, Chris has uh, skills that uh, transcend uh, intellectual. He's very intellectual, but the only intellectual in the family I married into, I might say. But uh, uh, he, he makes up for the rest of us. And, uh, but also, he's a building contractor from time to time. He's a gourmet cook from time to time. He's been, I think, a director of an art museum. There isn't anything he hasn't done, and he does all of them excellently, as I know he will this evening. Chris Carroll. Well, and as you can see, I've packed the room with relatives. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've done that on purpose, and my wife Susan, as soon as her class is over, is going to hobble over uh, and try to keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, and as, uh, as usual, I've both over-prepared and not prepared at all for this talk, uh, largely because of what I discovered about teaching, uh, that I did best uh, in those golden years uh, when I was still teaching by filling myself up and then coming in and going off uh, and uh, judging 
the direction I was going to go, and I, I didn't take a vote or anything like that, but uh, the direction I was going to go from, from the class and from students. And I was terrified that um, they would go to sleep, uh, and so always had to do it hot and on the hoof, and I presume to do that today. Well, I am here to talk about my grandfather, in fact, our grandfather, uh, with a lot of members here in the room, um, Selim Franklin. Uh, and I've been working on him and on family history since long before I retired, or rather uh, went into recovery from teaching at the university. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a recovering professor. Um, the, uh, but but uh, so there's an awful lot to say, and especially about this man who I've become enormously fond of. Uh, my mother uh, always talked about him as the sweetest man she'd ever known, and uh, reading his letters, uh, watching him operate in a in a number of, of different fields during his life, has convinced me that she was probably right. Um, and I think we can start off. I can. Ah, let's try this. Uh, that's Selim on the left. Uh, this was in San Bernardino, uh, and that is his brother uh, Abraham on the right. Their father, Maurice, was a photographer as well as a druggist. And so uh, we have, I have several wonderful pictures of him as a little kid. Uh, that's again, Selim on the left and Abraham on the right. Uh, and there is Father Franklin, Selim on the left, Abraham on the right. Um, Uncle Abe, Abraham, uh, came out to Arizona Territory from uh, where they grew up in San Bernardino uh, in the hmm, mid-70s uh, and went to work for their uncles, the Jacobs brothers, who first had a store, two really nice Jewish boys from San Bernardino in black suits, hats, setting off with 20 mules and a wagon full of canned goods in August to cross the desert and come to Tucson. Uh, and they made it. And they wrote about it. And in special collections, uh, in the Jacobs papers, which are, gosh, how many feet of boxes? Uh, it's a, this huge collection. Uh, they, were, they were wonderful and anal retentive, and they kept uh, everything letters and, and uh, accounts and everything else. And Abe came first and was working for them. Uh, he ran a store in Safford. Uh, he ran, and he tells uh, in, a, in a memoir that he wrote, he tells a wonderful story uh, about how uh, his life was saved in Gailyville. You probably don't know about Gailyville. It, it was a town that only lasted for about three years. And it was the it was the pit of all humanity, uh, and his his life was saved because he'd been sent to Mexico to uh, to bring back some Mexican cattle to sell to the army. He gleefully said that the main uh, activity in Tucson in those early days was fleecing the government. Uh, things haven't changed so much, uh, uh, but at any rate, uh, he was driving cattle back. And uh, in Gailyville, he ran into Johnny Ringo, who really took a shine to him, and he called him the kid, and he would he would uh, he would kid him uh, a lot, and Ringo and his friends would go out and steal cattle from this herd, and then bring them back and resell them to Uncle Abe uh, as strays. Uh, and this was well, it was just sort of the toll for going through his territory, but. Uh, Abe tells a story uh, about about being in Gailyville, uh, coming in to, to have a drink, uh, and a guy at the bar took against him 
and started shoving and, and pushing around until Johnny Ringo came up behind him and said, this here is the kid, Abe Franklin. He's a friend of mine. Uh, and so Abe escaped to have two daughters and, uh, and the rest of his life. At any rate, I'm sorry to, to get off the main topic, but this is Selim at a slightly older age. And uh, in, he was in the class of 1882 at UC Berkeley. He was a, uh, a really pretty good student. Uh, and I could tell you a number of things that I've discovered. But one thing I think that was the most important to me uh, was at UC Berkeley, uh, he has a letter. It's in the Jacobs collection, actually, and I ran into it again a couple days ago. Uh, a letter that he wrote to his uncles, the Jacobs brothers, because he had an aunt, uh, Aunt Amelia, in... Oakland, who was married to a drunken abuser and who threw her out in the street with her kids. Uh, the landlord took all of her clothes uh, in payment of back rent, and, uh, and Selim uh, was, and he, he I, I can't even come close to his words, but he apologized for, for being so uppity as to suggest to his uncles that he wanted to use some of his inheritance to buy her a house and furniture so she could never be thrown out again. For a 19-year-old kid, that's something. And uh, it, it, uh, it moved me a great deal. In 1883, he stayed a little while, took law courses, uh, and passed the bar. Uh, and then, in 1883 as well, he came out to, let's see if I can find this, he came out to, um, to Tucson. He, he has a wonderful story that he never completed. It was a, his essay, a, a little biographical story that he intended to give to the Tucson Literary Club, of which he was one of the uh, initial members. And... Uh, the start of it, though, I'd like to read to you. Uh, it is my first experience as a prospector. The paper which Mr. Clark read, this was a, uh, the essay of the month before, uh, to us at the recent meeting, some experiences, was so interesting, illuminative, instructive, and so provocative of almost, uh, of almost as interesting a discussion that I've been tempted to follow in the path he trod, to give some of my experiences, but not like his of a spiritual uh, or religious nature, but in the line of adventure, if one can call it that, in the early days of Arizona. That is to say, my first experience as a prospector. Nor must you gentlemen consider uh, the reader of this paper, he wrote this in 1927, uh, the reader of this paper, who's nearing the traditional three score years and ten, is psychologically and philosophically the same as the young man whose experiences I shall relate, although he is the same person. Uh, Salem Franklin was born in 1859, uh, in the class of 1882, stayed to take courses in law uh, out at 1883. Um, it was in the year of 1883, in the glare of hot summer morning in May, uh, for May in Tucson seemed summer to me, uh, that I first beheld the dreary, flat adobe buildings and the streets without sidewalks or trees that was then Tucson. My coming was for the purpose of accomplishing two things. First, to practice my profession of law for five years in a new community where my youthfulness and inexperience would not be found such a handicap as I found it at home in California. Uh, second, to make a quick fortune in this fabled and primitive land of silver and gold with the five, with the five years added to my then 24 
and the wealth I expected to acquire, I would return to my native state, a tried and experienced lawyer, a man of means, to marry a pretty girl, have a home, and be a lawyer uh, at the bar in my native state. This program was definite, clear-cut, beautifully outlined. It was not long, however, before I discovered that as far as making a fortune was concerned, all I could hope for from the law was a bare sufficiency uh, to pay my monthly bills. Uh, my brother-in-law, Dick Duffield, is a, is a lawyer, and he assures me that that's true. <laughs> uh, a quick fortune was not to be made that way. In those days, nearly every man in Tucson was interested in mining. Fortunes had been made and were being made at Tombstone. Merchants, lawyers, doctors, clerks, mechanics, everyone, in fact, was grub-staking some prospector or alleged prospector and sending him uh, or them into the uncharted and almost unknown hills and mountains to discover other tombstones, bisbees, and silver kings. At first, I thought it was the dry, exhilarating air which breathed into men's lungs, uh, filled them all with such radiant hopefulness and buoyancy, such faith in the discovery of wealth hidden in the distant hills. But soon, I believed the wealth was really there. Uh, for mining, the mining boom was on, and it was the boom they were breathing, as well as the air that created the castles in the air. And I, too, breathing the boom as well as the air, had the same vision as the rest of them. One evening in August, after I had been in Tucson for about four months, a hot, dry evening after a hotter day, I went to see Deputy Sheriff Vosberg, then keeper uh, for the sheriff, uh, a, a deputy uh, at the at the store on the corner of Meyer and Camp Street, upon which my law firm, that's Meyer and Congress, where just about where the uh, city hall is, um, upon which my law firm Farley and Franklin had levied an attachment. I went because I liked Bossberg and wanted to smoke a cigar with him uh, in the front of the store where he sat in the evenings. Uh, catching a fleeting breeze. Fosberg, a man of 40, a bachelor, uh, came from a little town in the state of New York where he was a carpenter, uh, receiving there $2 a day for his labor. In Arizona, carpenters received $4 a day. Uh, that was the magnet which brought him to Tucson. He'd not been here long until he discovered that he could make his $4 a day as a deputy sheriff acting as a watchman or keeper of property in the custody of law. So he laid aside his plain and square and 10 hours a day as sweaty labor in the summer heat uh, for the lighter job of doing practically nothing mm -hmm. and getting the same compensation for it. Um, I found him seated in a wooden chair tilted against the wall in front of the store smoking a pipe listening to a man who wore the unmistakable garb of prospector, a blue denim shirt, blue overalls, a jaunty, short-brimmed, disreputable hat, and heavy, hob-nailed shoes. Bosberg introduced him. This is Harvey Hansom. I suppose you've heard of, of, of him. I don't think he's related to Thor Hansen, but it could be. Uh, I had to admit I never had, but expressed pleasure at meeting him just the same, a perfunctory politeness. Harvey Hansen uh, deemed it necessary to explain, yes sir, I'm a prospector and I have been for 20 years. I've made and spent more fortunes than any man in three territories. Vosberg here has been telling me about you, a bright young lawyer, and I want to tie up with you fellows who can help me keep a fortune after I make it. I can make it all right, but I need a lawyer in my business to help me keep it. I was highly flattered. Vosberg then explained the proposition. He goes on to tell a story of going to look for a man named Jim Blades who had discovered a rich silver lead mine in the Tucson Mountains. Uh, but he discovered it years before 1880 when the railroad had come to Tucson and they couldn't get the ore out. And so uh, and Blades had been hitting the bottle and so they went off in search of blades, and so they're going to form a partnership to mine the Tucson Mountains, 
and uh, Blaze is is, uh, is serving as a dealer uh, at the feast of St. Augustine uh, down at the river, and he describes that. Um, then, unfortunately, the story breaks off because, unfortunately, that week he died on the golf course at the Tucson Country Club. Uh, I suppose paradise for a golfer, but uh, it's why I've never played golf. I consider it a really dangerous place to go. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, the image of himself as young, idealistic, very hopeful, really hot and dusty uh, in a, a frontier town that could just barely be called a town of flat mud buildings uh, is a good start. It was in 1885, uh, which is just a few years after the picture that you have here, let's see if I can, that, that uh, Selim Franklin was elected, he was one of five representatives to the territorial legislature. Uh, and he, uh, there were, of, of the representatives, there were two houses in the territorial uh, government, uh, just as there are now, but instead of the Senate, uh, it was, um, gosh, what did they call it? Uh, council. Yeah, the council. And he was a representative, he was a Democrat, all the other four were Republicans, and of course, uh, and my great grandfather, uh, Colonel Herring, was a was a famous Republican. But I don't know. You have to date the language. Republican then meant progressive. Um, I don't know what's happened to that word uh, <laughs> since then. But uh, at any rate, uh, there he was. He was just barely 25. Uh, he was the youngest member of the legislature, and. Uh, he himself tells the story at some length in, uh, in the Founders' Day speech in 1922, the first Founders' Day at the university, uh, that's also in special collections. Uh, he, he gave the copy himself. Uh, and he tells in detail what a very complicated uh, political configuration. Uh, but it turns out that however badly you have taken the record of the Arizona legislature for, let's say, the last half a dozen years, it used to be even worse. Uh, that uh, certainly un uh, less, even less predictable. And the, the 13th Territorial Legislature had a lot on its plate. Uh, Tucson, up until 77, I believe, had been the capital of the territory. And then, because Yavapai County uh, was the most populous and richest and turned out most powerful, the capital had been moved to Prescott. And so in all those intervening years, there was this big argument of wanting to move the capital back down to Tucson, uh, the people from northern Arizona fighting against that. Uh, and it looked like the argument could go on forever with a stalemate. So the whole legislative delegation met at uh, Mansfeld Stationery Store, uh, as, as usual, um, and they talked this over. And uh, there were going to be several big appropriations in that legislature. One was for state hospital, the insane asylum, and that was probably the, the $10,000, big, big appropriation. Um, the, the other was uh, the question of whether to move the territorial prison from Yuma. Uh, but uh, there, were, there were other suggestions, gee, if we're going to stay away from uh, where the capital is going to be, uh, and it took Phoenix, uh, the people from Maricopa County, uh, and actually the people from both other ends of the state, uh, another two years to figure out that it ought to be in Phoenix just because it was so hard to get from here to Prescott in those days. Uh, and it was so hard to get from Prescott to here 
in those days. Uh, and Phoenix didn't have much going for it. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a shabby little town of just a few thousand people, but it was in the middle of the state. Uh, and so uh, they p- talked about, about what to get, and they decided that, gee, I guess we'd better settle. Do you really want the state insane asylum? Well, that's not really good for the Sunshine Climate Club. Uh, the prison, no, I think we could do without that. Uh, we can't do the capital, so what are we going to go for? Uh, we don't need a bridge. Uh, and so they decided before they went that maybe they ought to go for the university. And C.C. C. Stevens uh, was, was the, the senior statesman from Tucson, and he was on the council. Uh, and he, he was going to put the bill in to have the university founded in Tucson, in the council. But uh, when he got to uh, Prescott, to the capital, the members of the council all got together, and uh, I think they still do this uh, in spite of sunshine laws, um, and decided, no, they were not going to talk about moving the capital. Uh, B, uh, people from Cochise County were interested in dividing the county in two, and they didn't want that to happen. Uh, they were not going to uh, have any onerous regulations on the railroad, which pleased C.C. C. Stevens, who was involved with the railroad. Uh, and so they made this complex deal of who was going to get what and who wasn't going to vote for what. And so this all went along, except that there was a, there was a big cattleman named Mesh from Tucson, and uh, there had been, after the, after the legislators had all left, took was a three-day trip. Uh, they took the train to Maricopa. It didn't go to Phoenix yet. In fact, uh, in the 13th legislature, they funded a branch line uh, to go from Maricopa to Phoenix. Uh, then uh, it took a stage to Phoenix and spent the night. Uh, then took a stage which took a night and a day from, uh, from Phoenix up the Black Canyon Highway to get to Prescott. And it was a really bitchy trip. Uh, anyway, uh, the, after they left, there was a big public meeting in Tucson. And they said, University, you've got to be kidding. Uh, what we want is the capital. They raised uh, what Granddaddy called a sack, 4000 bucks, And Mesh arrived. And he's apparently a very big man, from what, from what Stephen Franklin says. Uh, and he, he got the, uh, they had a, uh, an immediate meeting in what they then called, as he says, a hotel, uh, a hotel room. And Mesh himself was in the only chair, and all the legislators were on the bed. <laughs> I've stayed at that motel, I, I, and it's probably, it's probably true. Um, but Mesh said, okay, boys, I've got a sack and we are going to get the capital. And he, he gave every legislator a $20 bill. He said he had 4000 bucks, and there was a lot more where that came from, and they were going to get it one way or another. And he, he gave everybody a $20 bill, and he says, go out and convince those boys uh, that we want the capital in Tucson. And uh, Granddaddy said, and we took the money, and we had a hell of a good time. Uh, and they had a hell of a good time. And uh, in the in the uh, in the House, uh, they even voted. <laughs> I think it may have taken forty bucks, not twenty. But they even voted to have the capital move to Tucson. Uh, but in the Council, uh, this got nowhere. The law came up, and it got sat on day after day after day. And finally, uh, this group of seven. Uh, council members uh, decided that they were going to treat it head on, uh, and it, the, the moving the capital to Tucson got voted down. And this was the next to the last day of the legislature. And nothing had been done, uh, although the, the council, uh, Stevens, had passed 
the approval of uh, founding a university, uh, nothing had been done about this. And it was virtually too late to, to, uh, to have it work. Only two days. They had to suspend the, the first and second readings of the bill. The bill uh, for the, for the, to have the university move uh, was there by title only. Um, and so they passed it because Stevens had, been, had hung tough on the moving to the Capitol and all the deals had been worked out. But as Granddaddy says in the history, the trouble is all the deals had been worked out. I didn't have anything to bargain with. I mean, hey, Florence had already gotten a bridge, which two years later, because the river changed course, uh, was just high and dry. Uh, there, was bank, there was bank improvement for Yuma County. Uh, Phoenix had gotten the insane asylum. All the goodies had been passed out. And so he said, and what a fix. Uh, he had to get this passed in the, in the, in the uh, House sheerly, by, sheer, by, by his sheer persuasive ability. And he was the youngest guy there and the least experienced and the most idealistic. And he'd made as many enemies by voting against stuff uh, or voting for stuff on principle because he had no politics at all uh, in, in how he looked at stuff. Uh, so that, that uh, there he was. And the speech he gave was a wowser. He had some help. Because the the uh, the head of uh, public education in Arizona was a, a friend of his from Tucson, and he was on the scene, and he rousted out all of the teachers in Flagstaff and Yavapai County, as well as the ministers and anybody else who could be bought to make noise, uh, to be in all the lobbies. He even made an arrangement with the Speaker of the House, who was also a uh, refined old gentleman, according to Granddaddy from from Tucson, uh, that he wouldn't that he that while he would still invoke the the forbidding of applause, that he wouldn't really hold anybody to it. So Selim Franklin made his pitch, and uh, I'll read you his version of exactly what he said, if I can find it. Uh, huh. Of these preliminaries, he said, that is, uh, the, the crowd fixing it with the speaker, that that he would allow uh, a demonstration. I knew nothing. Uh, though was it for me that upon my young and inexperienced shoulders I laid the burden of convincing an indifferent and to some extent hostile house that our bill should pass. I say somewhat hostile house, for during the previous weeks of the season I'd made many a fight against bills other members had introduced. I had been a young, enthusiastic freelance, controlled by a consideration of, but not controlled by an a, a consideration of policy or expediency, fighting what I thought was wrong, helping what I thought was right. They don't have these guys anymore in the legislature. Uh, leaving my pathway strewn with as many enemies as friends, for I was young, carefree a knight for the first time on his charger uh, to right the wrong whenever he found it. And when it, was, and when it was too late did I appreciate how grievously others could retaliate upon me. The bill came up on motion to suspend uh, the second and third readings and place it upon its final passage. It never had been read except by title. Exactly what I said in that speech other than to state the salient provisions of the bill, I do not recall except this. I told my associates uh, it was conceded that the 13th legislature was the most energetic, the most contentious, and the most corrupt legislature ever in the history of Arizona. Uh, we were called the fighting 13th, the bloody 13th, the thieving 13th, 
and we deserved these names and more, and we all knew it. We'd employed so many clerks for our committees that each member had one and a half clerks. We had subsidized the local press with extravagant appropriations uh, so that our shortcomings should not be published in the columns. We had voted ourselves additional pay in violation of the Act of Congress. But, gentlemen, here is an opportunity to wash away our sins. Let us establish an institution of learning. Let us pass this bill creating a university where for all time to come, the youth of this land may have opportunities of education, where they may learn to be better citizens than we are. And all of our shortcomings will be forgotten in a misty past, and we shall be remembered only for this one great achievement. There came to me the picture of Commencement Day at Berkeley, where three years before, as a member of the class of 1882, I'd received my degree. I pictured to my associates the commencement days of our future University of Arizona, when the graceful maidens in white gowns and the stalwart youth, seated amidst bowers of flowers, facing great stretches of green lawn. Uh, would raise their voices in praise of the glorious 13th legislature which had given them this greatest opportunity of their lives. For our own salvation, gentlemen, we must vote for this bill. There then arose applause, such as we'd not heard in the House before. The lobbies cheered and stamped and clapped their hands. The Speaker rapped for order so gently that no one heard him. <laughs> On a wave of enthusiasm, the bill was passed with only one dissenting vote, and that of a member from Cochise County, a gentleman who afterwards was Secretary of the Territory, and he came and explained that he had vowed to vote against anything Pima County asked in retaliation for Pima County's opposition to his bill to divide Cochise County. Uh, on March 12, 1885, the governor approved the bill, and it became law. Well. This was a great achievement, a funny achievement, uh, a legislative achievement. But it wasn't the last connection that Salem Franklin had to the university. Um, he was uh, uh, several things. Uh, in order for the university to uh, receive the appropriation that had been voted, they had to have 40 acres of land donated uh, to, as, a, as a kind of matching fund. And nobody had come forth with anything. The deadline was coming up, and uh, Mr. Mansfeld from the, uh, I'm a proud alumnus of Mansfeld Junior High, which was named after him, not far from here, uh, uh, who had the stationery store, and Salem Franklin as a young lawyer, started twisting arms. And a guy who owned a bar, and as he describes it, uh, several gamblers who uh, had the biggest book in Tucson uh, were their targets. Uh, they managed to convince them. And it, it's funny, one of those gamblers was a client of Salem Franklin's. Maybe he had an edge. but. Uh, they got them. They got these guys to buy a piece of absolutely useless flat land uh, and to donate 40 acres of it for the university. And that's where we are right now. Uh, but it didn't end there either. Uh, a few years later, uh, Salem Franklin was appointed to the Board of Regents, and the the biggest deal going was uh, the, the uh, is it the Mor Moral Act, uh, that for, for uh, land-grant colleges. In order to get the $15,000 a year, they had to establish an experimental station and have it staffed and have it part of a, a college university. And in order to do that, uh, they had to have a faculty. 
and they didn't have any money. Uh, so they decided that what they would do is a kind of con job. They would name uh, one of the free Board of Regents as a faculty, and then they did a survey, and it turned out that Selim Franklin was the only member of the Board of Regents who had a college degree. So he was named the first, he, the, the director of the experimental station, uh, and that became the University Farm. Uh, it became the experimental station on, on Tumamont. Uh, they did wonderful things and had great people. But he was named the first professor of agriculture, and the only thing he knew about agriculture that I'm aware of was having translated Virgil's Georgics in his freshman Latin class at UC Berkeley. Uh, and what, uh, what the experimental station did and what the College of Architecture did uh, went way beyond the technology of Virgil. I can tell you that. Um, but he remained uh, not only interested, but deeply involved in the university in all kinds of ways. Uh, there's there's a, a couple of mysterious letters in the Franklin collection, and here in special collections, um, of letters back and forth between uh, Selim and the governor, uh, in fact, various governors. Uh, he was uh, replaced as the treasurer of the Board of Regents um, in favor of, uh, of his good friend and, and next door neighbor. Um, and he said he would certainly resign to do it. But the Regents in those days, and unfortunately in very recent times too, uh, turned out to be uh, political appointments. And so uh, when he resigned, uh, the governor, who was in a different party from his own, wrote him back and said, was he resigning because of, for political reasons? Because if he was, he knew how important he had been in the establishment of the university, and they didn't want him to resign. So he re-upped. Um, anyway, the, the, what, what went on uh, with the university uh, not only the $15,000 a year from the feds for the land grant, uh, but raising money for one building after another with one president after another. And I can tell you a, a side story about that, too. Uh, the first chancellor of the university, and this was uh, a member of the Board of Regents who, who ran everything, uh, was, a, was a new system, was my great-grandfather, uh, Colonel William Herring. His picture is over there in the top hat. He's a vast man. Uh, and <clears throat> he was the chancellor in 1901. And I know this is going to be a shock to you, but there was once a member of the university faculty who was fired for sexual harassment. Now, in my 40 years at the university, uh, I, I suspect there was a great deal of sexual harassment, but uh, the perpetrators of it were always given a golden parachute or a, or a leg up or something of the sort. Uh, but there was somebody fired. And you know who it was? It was M.M. M. Parker, the president of the university. And you know who fired him? This letter is in special collections. Uh, and it's almost by itself. All the other records were thrown out. Uh, or misplaced or lost, William Herring fired him. Uh, and M.M. M. Parker, oh, what a case he was, he was a very straight-laced guy. Uh, he had started the Pasadena Academy, uh, which later went together uh, with another school and became Caltech in Pasadena. He was a, a city father of Pasadena. They named their first fire engine after him. Uh, and how famous can you get? I, uh, but uh, and he was he was he was uh, apparently very stiff, uh, laced up character, uh, because he refused to allow a photograph of the senior class to be published, because two couples were seen holding hands in the picture. But. Uh, the, the letter says, because of his speech and actions toward certain 
female uh, faculty members, uh, that his services would no longer uh, be, no, be needed. Uh, there's also a picture, not just of the two couples holding hands, but of the faculty. And I don't know, it could only be one person. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, uh, and Salem Franklin himself was back for more. He was a great friend of uh, a number of the presidents. Uh, Rufus von Kleinschmidt, who was uh, a, he was a, a very, very popular president of the university, uh, went on from here to be the longest reigning president at USC. Uh, and uh, uh, under von Kleinschmidt, the university became uh, academically um, recognized. And later, uh, the uh, The, the, uh, the later president that he was very good friends with was uh, Cloyd Marvin. And uh, he was a guy who had uh, had gone to UCLA. He'd been in World War I as a fighter pilot, uh, had gone back to UCLA to, uh, to, he'd been to Stanford, then UCLA to get his BA, got a PhD at Harvard, and uh, came here from being a, a, a dean at UCLA to become president. And he must have been uh, a real pistol. <coughs> he was enormously unpopular among the faculty because he wanted to reduce the number of <coughs> Deadwood professors. And everybody ought to know that that's impossible. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a great idea. Um, but uh, there arose against Marvin and uh, and Granddaddy. Uh, Marvin was responsible for a couple of great constructions. One was during his reign and at his uh, his inauguration. Uh, they also had the opening of the uh, of the uh, telescope. Uh, but uh, he he was responsible for getting appropriations and the design of the new library, that is, the old library, uh, the one that's across from the Arizona State Museum and uh, still arguably one of the most gorgeous academic buildings in the West, um, and uh, of Bear Down Gym, so that the building that had been named after my great-grandfather, Colonel Herring, Herring Hall, could be abandoned as the gym, it could be turned over to be the girls' gym, uh, and bear down, uh, put us on the uh, athletic map. At the groundbreaking <coughs> for the library, and this has been traditional, the uh, dean of agriculture with a horse and a plow broke the ground. And they had the same ceremony when the ground was broken for this library under John Schaefer. Uh, but it was Granddaddy Selim Franklin who gave the address uh, for the groundbreaking at the library. Unfortunately, when uh, when and this was in the early part of uh, of the presidency, uh, I can find it. Um, Marvin had gotten into such hot water with some of the faculty uh, and with a number of ministers in town uh, that they brought suit against him. They went to the regents and tried to get him fired. They accused him of all sorts of stuff. 
he was a good friend of the Franklins, and they supported him. Uh, here's what uh, Selim has to say. I suppose this is a one frustrating thing about about getting into family letters is that it's only when people are out of town that you write letters, uh, and so it's only when there's somebody who's really good to write to that they're there. Uh, this letter is from Granddaddy to my mother, uh, Gladys Franklin, uh, and she was off at college. I suppose, uh, actually in grad school at Wellesley, I suppose some of us have told you about the fight headed by Lockwood Cummins, G.S.P. Smith, and sponsored by the Reverend Mr. Tuthill, who was Granny's minister, uh, that has been made on President Marvin. These parties have heard, uh, have been heard before the Board of Regents. Their testimony and that of their witness has been taken down in shorthand and transcribed. On June 1st, Dr. Marvin will have his opportunity to present his own testimony and his witnesses to the Regents uh, who meet here at the, at the time to hear it. Dean Butler is in charge of Dr. Marvin's side of the case. From all I can learn, there was nothing in all the evidence produced by the kickers to show our faith in Dr. Marvin and let the people of, the, the, of this town know uh, and of the entire state know our opinion of him, we gave the reception or garden party on May 26th, and it was a great success. Uh, and he goes on to describe it. It had rained in the morning and afternoon, so the lawn uh, part of it was given up. But Mother cleared the furniture out of our bedroom, put tables for refreshments and chairs in there, and we had <coughs> and we had the party in the house. It was very cool, almost cold. At the north end of the front porch, we put the kitchen table. Uh, on that was a 16-gallon keg of Rainier near beer. This was during Prohibition. Uh, big plates with all kinds of sandwiches, pretzels and dill pickles. William, uh, he was the gardener, uh, in a Palm Beach suit, which I gave him, drew the beer into steins and glasses. It was a regular free lunch affair and made things very jolly. In the dining room, uh, on the dining room table, which was in the bay window, was our cut glass punch bowl. It's still in the dining room. Uh, with Concord grape punch. In our bedroom were ten tables where ice cream, cake, and coffee were served. Uh, we had only invited Dr. Marvin's friends, but that included all the leading people of the town. Some 150 or 175 were present. It sure was some demonstration for the Marvins. And toward the last, Marietta, my dear Aunt Mimi, uh, came, and she and Selim had their, this is Selim Jr., had their ice cream and cake together. As the song goes, oh joy, oh rapture. Uh, well, girly, Soon we will see you, and Gladys was planning to meet the family in California for a vacation. Um, and then more of this. My grandmother's letter on the same occasion goes on to describe, I was glad to have the reception for the Marvins. They were so happy over it, and stayed all evening. And when they left, she came and kissed me because she said I was so sweet, and she loved me. It's a great world after all is said and done. Um, now, as, as uh, the letters here suggest, Marvin was a formidable man. Uh, one of the events in his inauguration was the opening of the telescope at, at uh, Stewart Observatory, uh, and he got through the legislature perfectly designed for a perfectly magnificent library, as well as Jim. Um, he was the youngest president of the university, uh, and after and the, uh, this all went on, uh, and ultimately he decided that he had to leave. And when you leave under a cloud like that, your career is ruined, right? Well, no, not quite. Uh, there are a couple of letters of recommendation sent by Selim Franklin, 
uh, and Marvin became the president of George Washington University. And just as he had here, he put uh, the university on the map by getting it uh, fully accredited academically. Uh, and just as he had here, he got George Washington University uh, fully accredited. And he was the longest termed president of George Washington. At any rate, this was the very year that Granddaddy died on the golf course. Uh, and it was, uh, the, as the year went on, the library was completed. And uh, President von Kleinschmidt, uh, who had been the wildly successful president before Marvin, uh, was asked over to dedicate not only the library, but uh, the Temple of Music and Art, which you all know, being from Tucson, uh, which was the model for the Pasadena Playhouse, which was built two years later, uh, and is even more beautiful than that. Um, and the Marvins came, uh, the uh, von Kleinschmidts came, and uh, the Franklins were not asked to the reception for the library uh, because there was still such hard feeling among the division in the, the, the Marvin affair and the, the people who were after him uh, divided all of Tucson society and of the state. And uh, this, this division went on for years. Granny never again went to the Reverend Dr. Tuthill's church. Uh, that's why she became one of the founders of St. Philip's. Uh, but, uh, but not being asked to the, uh, to the reception for the von Kleinschmitz uh, was obvious and, and out front. And Mrs. von Kleinschmidt uh, was giving to this tea at the Santa Rita with 200 people there, uh, was giving a talk on friendship. And uh, she said, uh, she was talking about friendship, and she said, but, but where is Mrs. Franklin? Isn't Mrs. Franklin here? Is she sick? Granddaddy loved this and told it with great glee to his daughters in their, in, uh, their letters. Well, uh, Seymour Franklin has kept up with the, I mean, he not only gave the, the, the speech, uh, he, was, he was asked to give oh, a couple of speeches at commencement. Uh, he was given an honorary degree, as great granddaddy had been, to the university. Uh, he was uh, an important member of the university committee for a very long time. Uh, he was recognized uh, just after this library was built. Um, you might recall they built a founder's fountain right out there in the mall. Uh, and even though the same architect designed it, it was awful. Uh, and it was devoted, had a plaque uh, with Salem Franklin's name and the other, uh, the, uh, the, the other founders, uh, C.C. Stevens and so on. But uh, the design left a lot to be desired. It looked like, well, it looked like a pissoir for the Maginot Line. Uh, it, was, it was all brick and, and looked like tank traps. And inside the fountain was a sort of bright aqua-colored tile. And I had a vision. Uh, this was the day when they still had physical education courses. Uh, and guys would do laps around the mall in their gray sweatshirts. And I, I had a vision of them all lining up to take a leak uh, as they <laughs> did their laps. Uh, well, the, the Founders Fountain was taken down uh, in order to build the ILC. And I can tell you a long story about that, but I won't. Uh, at any rate, uh, at least the tradition of the Founders Fountain survived. That is, they built another fountain, you know, the one that's over next to the uh, student union. Um, and they, they didn't put the founders' names on it because somebody else had given money, so it's, it's devoted to, uh, to something else, and it has inspiring things like Inspire on it, uh, things like that. But 
damned if it doesn't. It's 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 uh, slabs of granite like this, with uh, with little streams of water going and. Yeah, it, it looks exactly like the men's room in Grand Central Station. So at least the architecture has been consistent. Um, and just about the same time, the new law school, the one on, on Speedway was built, uh, and the old law school, which was over near uh, Park Avenue, uh, was changed in its function. And gee, what a neat thing. Uh, our, one of our founders was a lawyer. We'll name that building after him, the Selim M. Franklin Building. And I remember it was an awful building. Uh, I taught in it. And I, I, never mind. Uh, it, 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 and I could even tell you a good deal about the architect of it. But nevertheless, uh, I remember vividly my going to uh, a recruiting party. Uh, what they put in the old law school building, the Franklin building, was the departments of journalism and what they then called Oriental Studies. Uh, that's a P anti PC no no now of course. But uh, I went to a recruiting cocktail party. Uh, Oriental Studies was looking for someone in Hebrew. And so uh, there I was standing there uh, trying to be polite and intelligent uh, with my martini. And that, there was a heated argument going on because they knew that they were going into the Selim Franklin building. And they were sure, they were arguing linguistically, that he must be an Arab. Because Selim is an Arabic name, which of course it is. It's what... Uh, <laughs> They name a lot of horses, or they used to in the old days of the sheikhs, Selim. It's cognate with shalom. And it's also a Jewish word. Uh, he, Selim was named after his uncle, Selim Franklin, uh, who, who had a distinguished career in British Columbia. Uh, he and his brother, Lumley, founded Vancouver. And on Vancouver Island, uh, there's a Franklin River that's named after Selim Franklin. He was a world-class chess master, among other things. Uh, but at any rate, I set him straight. I said, no, he's a good Jewish boy. Uh, and half of them were disappointed. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think, I think it's, what, it's what allowed them to hire somebody in Hebrew because the Hebrew side was joyous about it. But, of course, the Franklin building's gone now, too. And uh, the building that got put up is a very beautiful one, but it's named for the people who, who uh, paid the money to get it put up. Selim Franklin still resides at the university. A lot of him is found, as I can vouch for this, in special collections. But he's also a name on a little piece of stone on a tree well and those trees that are just on the other side of the administration building. And it seems to me that he deserves a little more than that. Uh, you know, my mother, as I recall, Dick could probably tell me, uh, gave a lot of money to build the Founders Fountain. I thought it was a mistake for reasons that I've already explained. Uh, but uh, to get wiped out like that doesn't seem fair to me. So. One reason that I want to bring him back alive, uh, to, to convey his voice to you, and the, the amazing and difficult stuff that in this dusty place got done to get us started with where we are, is to bring him back and make him remember. Uh, at any rate, from the thieving 13th to the University of Arizona. Uh, still contentious, but that'll have to do. Thanks for coming. I'd be glad to answer any question about anything, any question whatsoever.
Thank you very much, Chris. And Chris said he'll take questions if you have any. I don't know whether the refreshments are still out over in the other room there. For those of you who want to buy bacon or some food, we have the Catholic County and other questions. I have a question, Chris. Yeah. I am curious um, at your kind of offhand remark that you were, there was a picture of the university faculty at the time when Herring fired whoever he was. Parker, Parker right. Parker, right. And you said, in an offhand way, it could only have been one person. And my question is, <coughs> is that because there was only one woman on the faculty? Oh, no. There were several women. Okay. Uh, but you wouldn't want to mess with most of them. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry about that. I, I, uh, it's not a sexist comment. It's an aesthetic one. Uh, yeah, they don't want to get home. So there was only one pretty woman. Yes. Would you like me to break into song now? <laughs> <laughs> can you sing Pretty Woman? I can. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't show you all the pictures, uh, and I, I have a, a lot of pictures, but uh, this picture, uh, it was taken in front of Colonel Herring's house, and it was taken uh, in the summer of the year that uh, the Franklins got married. That's 1898. Uh, the Herring's house is still there, by the way. It's now a, uh, a daycare center. Um, and. The pith helmet and the bicycle come up in a letter that my grandmother wrote to Selim in Tucson. He was working, and she said that she could sure use seeing a young man in a pith helmet come around the corner on his wheel. Uh, there he is with his wheel. Uh, this is uh, shortly before, uh, this was after my Aunt Sarah had gotten married to Tom Soren, uh, and this is when the engaged couple, that's my grandmother on the horse, uh, Selim on the left with the umbrella, Tom Soren on the right, after the Sorens had gotten married that summer uh, in the Dragoon Mountains, uh, a trip that they took. Uh, there is the, the usual picture of Selim Franklin as an old and established man, uh, just about the time that and I do have a picture of him on the golf course when he was still alive there, uh, but uh, but this is is him as a not as a as a kid. Yes, sir. Uh, tell us a little bit more about his involvement with the Owls Club. How did he get involved with the Owls Club? Well, he was an original owl. Uh, the Owls Club was a was a club of young professional men. His, his, uh, his uncle was in it. A number of people were in it. Um, and uh, uh, Tucson was a, a really rough and muddy place. There wasn't much going on. And these guys were attempting very hard to be classy. And so they formed a club. First, uh, they called it the mess, uh, just so that they could eat regularly. Uh, none of them had wives or, or uh, servants. Um, and then they, they had a, uh, it became a residence club, uh, and a large number of, uh, of people in Tucson history were members at one time or another, but as soon as you got married, you got thrown out. Um, not that you couldn't, but it was for bachelors only. And um, the, uh, the Owls Club had originally been downtown. Uh, then it moved to what's now called the Steinfeld Mansion at the corner of Franklin and Maine. Um, and it, actually, the building had been built for another family, but the Owls took it over for a while. And then they sold that house to the Steinfeld family and built the house, which is the current Owls Club, which is right next, and this was in 1903, which was right next to uh, our house on Maine. Um, the night my mother, my mother was born and she died in the bedroom that we still live in. That's pretty neat. She was probably conceived there too, but I haven't worked out the, the geometry of that. Um, 
But the night that she was that she was born, the owls then uh, down the street in the Steinfeld mansion were having a banquet, and uh, all the former owls, not Granddaddy, because Henrietta wasn't feeling well, but all the former owls were at the banquet, uh, including the doctor, uh, Hiram Fenner, uh, dear Doctor Fenner, as my mother, as my grandmother called him. Uh, and uh, he was a former owl, and he was summoned in his tuxedo that he'd just gotten for this party from San Francisco uh, to come over and deliver my mother, and he did it with a in an apron. Uh, so that uh, Dr. Fenner delivered all of the all four Franklin children, and according to my mother, uh, he was in a different costume for each delivery. <laughs> Uh, for for one for one of her sisters, he was in a swimsuit because it, he'd gone over and was staying with them in California. Uh, for my uncle Sonny, uh, he was summoned. Uh, he was out hunting javelina, and he he was uh, summoned from afar uh, to come in, and he was in his hunting suit. Uh, so uh, the the Fenners were very dear, close friends, uh, and I can just imagine. Granddaddy running over there saying, Hiram, you have to come quick. Uh, and they're running down the street, finding the kitchen apron to put on him for, for, uh, for the birth. But he was, uh, he's in uh, that famous picture of the earliest owls. Uh, and all these guys, I mean, it's amazing in the 1880s what you would do to look cool. Uh, and all these guys were really looking cool uh, for their for their age. Okay, if there are no more, oh, he has a question there. Just a quick footnote. Uh, I came because of this topic. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the presentation. Turns out my great great grandfather uh, Levi Ruggles was the founder of Florence, Arizona. And he was also in the 13th legislature, in the House, not in the, not in the Council. And one little tidbit was that he was running for the Speaker of the House. And it, and it took four days, uh, 33 votes tied, and people coming in and out. You know, we think about how divided our Congresses are today. This one was divided, this house was divided. And the 34th vote he lost. He lost to the gentleman that you spoke about. From, from he, Tucson. From Tucson. He probably lost because of uh, Mr. Mesh's sack. Well, I don't know anything about that. I'm looking for all the information I'm getting because I'm trying to write a paper about him. Uh, there's some fascinating stuff out there. Tell me, why did he name the town Florence? Aha. That Is that your... A long time. There are at least four or five versions of why he called it Florence. <laughs> uh, one of them being... Were there four or five know, women, different one, women named Florence? <laughs> this is the one that uh, was quite popular, was that he named it after Florence, Italy, because it had canals. Well, if you know much about Italy, the canals are in Venice. <laughs> so when, when Roger Nichols, I'm going to cut me off when I go through all When Roger Nichols wrote an article about the history of Florence, he called it uh, something about, he put Venice in the title. There are many, many other stories. My family says it was because of coming from, uh, a lot of family came from Massachusetts, near a town named Florence in Massachusetts. But there are many stories. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Chris, was M.M. Parker a, a cattle rancher? No. Oh, okay. He was, uh, he, uh, I've seen his house in Pasadena. Uh, and the wonder, M.M. Uh, Parker, he was the one who was fired, remember. Uh, when he died, uh, he had a four column obituary on the front page of the Pasadena paper with an enormous picture. And there wasn't a hint that he had even driven through the territory of Arizona. <laughs> so I take it that he, he did not uh, 
take his dismissal uh, lightly. But his son, strangely enough, didn't graduate from the university till the next year. Uh, so he he stayed on. He was captain of the football team. But he wasn't a cattle rancher. He was a, an educator. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. We really appreciate it. Thank you.